Okay, so maybe we'll start again. Yeah, so yeah, welcome to our Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Today we have Carlo Koch uh, from uh, the Faculty of IT at Monash. So Carlo was one of the first generation information warfare researchers during the 1990s. Uh, he produced multiple publications on information infrastructure vulnerability to electromagnetic threats. And in 1999, he was one of the two researchers who independently identified the information theoretic basis of deception. Uh, Carla is a multidisciplinary researcher with over 600 works spanning computer systems and networks, information warfare, and a range of strategy and military science topics. <clears throat> uh, he holds a PhD and MSc degrees from Monash and a, a BE honors degree in electrical engineering from UWA. And he's also a member of the ICM, a senior member of the IEEE, an associate fellow in the AIAA. So thank you very much, uh, Carlo. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Ron, for that. And uh, thank you to the audience for attending. I'll be uh, uh, probably trying to make up a little time since we had a bit of technical difficulty with our uh, uh, Zoom installation here. So uh, uh, with that having been said, I will uh, kick off the seminar. Now, the presentation I'm giving today is in part brand new and in part based on a presentation I did about 12 months ago for the IJCAI conference uh, um, uh, Deception in AI workshop. So a lot of these slides of been used before, and some of you may have seen them before. Uh, a lot of the slides are brand new and are picking up more recent work that I've done this year. So uh, let's kick off. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with my background, I, uh, in my youth, spent a lot of time aviating and uh, got to fly various interesting air aircraft, including a, uh, including an F-18. Uh, uh, F uh, uh, block two, sorry, block one. And uh, oh, that was 12 or 20 years ago. So, um, anyhow, uh, that uh, might explain some of my propensities. So, let's start out by asking some more fundamental questions. What is deception? Now, a definition that uh, was used by uh, myself with my colleagues, Kevin Corb and Bruce Mills in our 2018 clause one paper is deception is an action or intentional inaction that aims to bring the second party to a false belief state or to maintain a false belief state. The intent of a party producing a deception may or may not be to disadvantage the deceived party. So deceptions can arise regardless of the motive of the deceiver. Now, suffice to say, that's as about as broad a definition as you can get. There are a great many other definitions, many of which are a lot narrower. Um, false belief states, to elaborate on that, whether we're dealing with a social system like a community, individual human mind, a biological entity, or even a machine, can be false perceptions, false interpretations, some combination of the two. And there's also the issue of uncertainty that we'll talk about in, uh, in some detail, which is, of course, uh, not being certain about which state is actually false or correct. Now, there is a huge amount of empirical data that's been collected and published across a range of disciplines that show that deceptions an evolved survival mechanism in biological entities, and that includes human beings. I just don't have time to talk about it, but some of the examples I'll use for the deception mechanisms are, in fact, biological. Uh, humans migrated deceptions into machine systems, and good examples of that are electronic warfare, uh, a number of different cyber attacks, uh, bots used in social media, and various deceptive AIs. It turns out the maths are universally true, regardless as to whether it's biological or machine. Uh, maths is maths. Now, disinformation. What's disinformation? Well, disinformation we can describe as an instance of deception that has been framed in a social context. 
there are again a dime a dozen definitions out there and more often if you see disinformation defined it's attributed to governments or the context of politics but it's more broadly true there's been a vast amount of covid disinformation distributed some of which is politically aimed and some of which is just aimed to cause mischief so the definition that we use is disinformation is any deception via any means intended to disseminate a false belief or false interpretation to a victim population to advance or promote the attacker's agenda. Disinformation is frequently conducted in systematic campaigns, and this is very important because a lot of government deceptions uh, are conducted in a very, very systematic and structured way. A proxy may propagate disinformation without knowing it's a deception and without intent to deceive. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, in, in a little bit about that in more detail later. Uh, that's a very important effect. Disinformation is frequently a major component, and in some instances, the primary component of information warfare that is conducted by nation states or non-state entities. Uh, terrorist groups are a good example. So what are the challenges in investigating or researching deception and disinformation? What are the social challenges? What are the impacts? Well, what we're seeing at this point in history is a confluence of technological advancements in digital technology, but also a cultural shift away from people respecting facts and truth and often preferring make-believe. Uh, arbitrary acceptance of nonsense where it appeals to cognitive biases or other agendas of the audience. And Tom Nichols wrote a whole book about that, uh, Death of Expertise. Uh, it's highly recommended, talks a lot about Dunning-Kruger effect. Traditional deception methods have been adapted and enhanced using digital technology in often very, very creative ways. Very often software that was developed, for instance, for testing purposes, remote terminal emulation, ended up being adopted, uh, adapted to create uh, bots to mess with social media platforms. So we're dealing with new techniques like bots, deep fakes. And I sort of stumbled on the deep fake 20 years ago and wrote about it in a paper. It got ignored. Now deep fakes is great. And everybody wants to know about deep fakes and how to beat deep fakes. Um, AI analysis of data to sift out things that can be used uh, to optimize deceptions, et cetera. These are now being heavily used to influence politics and influence public debate. Now, the biggest single challenge in all of this is not being able to simply qualitatively describe what we're seeing. Lots of people have done that. There's a vast amount of literature on that produced in recent years. What is really important is accurate and explainable quantitative models on the science side that will capture the behavior of deceivers and their victims and can be more broadly used in a range of applications like simulations. Now, I've talked very briefly on this idea of empirical research, observing, describing, capturing the data, now, there is an enormous body of this type of research, and you'll find it in biology literature, psychology literature, social systems literature, and quite a lot of machine systems literature, such as cyber literature, electronic warfare. How we characterize this empirical research is that it will typically catalog deceptions as case studies and instances, and if you get a lot of a particular type of deception, will attempt to generalize how the deception is done and classify it in some fashion. Now, limitations of this type of empirical study are, well, there are at least three, and there are in fact more that I could think of, but these are the three big ones, that empirical study does not do well, and in some instances cannot do at all. One is explain complicated, complex, compound deceptions, and we'll talk about compound deceptions uh, a few slides downstream. Um, explain effects across multiple levels of abstraction within the system, which you can do with the quantitative models. In some instances, you just can't do it with qualitative models. And finally, produce quantitative models 
with which you can actually predict the outcome of a deception. Now, sometimes you can't predict it because you don't have enough data, but if you have enough data, do a prediction. Now, this is a very short and abbreviated uh, uh, history timeline of quantitative study of deception. It's incomplete. I've just focused on the most notable papers over the years. I have uh, not looked at the more recent stuff because I simply can't fit it into one slide. But 1970, well, during the 1960s, there was some initial work done, which is just not included here because it had very little impact. Uh, 1977, Bennett uh, did his famous paper in, uh, I think it was in Omega, on hypergames, which account for different ways in which players perceive what is happening in the game and how they interpret their opponents' beliefs in these games. And that was a very important piece of work. It crosses over between decision theory and game theory. 1982, Greenberg did a very important paper, still in some ways obscure because not a lot of people are doing work in this area. But what Greenberg did importantly, and this was more of a decision theory paper, he looked at uncertainty and false beliefs as being the effects of a deception. So if somebody subjects you to a deception, there are two possible effects, both of which might arise concurrently. One is uncertainty about beliefs, and the other is simply false beliefs. Now, in 1999, uh, Andy Borden published a paper. Uh, mine came out, I think, about six weeks after his uh, in an industry journal where we both used Shannon's information theory to explain how these deception mechanisms worked at the most basic channel level. Uh, Chris Wallace, who's foundation professor here, he reviewed my draft and said, hey, Carlo, you missed something. How about subversion? It turns out subversion is, in fact, one of the most important mechanisms, but it doesn't quite fit cleanly into Shannon's information theory. In 2003, I did a paper that... Uh, basically mapped these deception models into Bennett's hypergame model, and uh, that got me a best paper award at the conference at the time. Uh, 2006, uh, Kevin Corp and I were supervising Lachlan Brumley. He did a very nice paper on uh, OODA loop uh, cycles and uh, uh, how deceptions mapped into that, and that's really about cognition. In 2009, uh, uh, Joe Cruz and his student Lee uh, remapped Bennett's model into game theory. Uh, they're both control engineers, and they had some interesting observations to make on this. In 2018, what I did with Kevin Corb and Bruce Mills is we basically uh, fused all these models together into a framework, but really it's more than a framework. It's really a complete comprehensive model. And this year I did some work on adapting survivability models to deal with the disinformation problem. That hasn't been published yet. Now, this is integration of the uh, Borden Cop deception models, the information theory models into game theory and decision theory. So in the yellow strip at the top, we've got deception models. There are four of them. Degradation has two forms, covert, overt. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, denial can be implemented in various ways. Corruption and subversion, uh, unique mechanisms of their own. Each of these can produce particular deception effects. What's interesting about degradation is the two different forms either increase in certainty or, in fact, create false perceptions. Corruption can directly produce false interpretations, false, per uh, false perceptions, subversion of the same. Bottom line is false perceptions and interpretations lead to false beliefs. Increased uncertainty means you don't know which belief is true or not. These, of course, you can directly roll into a decision theory model, a game theory model, or a hyper game model. That is as in Bennett's hyper game model which is a fusion of decision theory, game theory. Now, what we have here is uh, something I have lifted from one of uh, Lachlan Brumley's works. Uh, this is from 2006, and this is uh, 
Boyd's uh, OODA loop, observation, orientation, decision, action. It's cognitive action cycle loop. There's a number of different cognitive cycle models in use. This just happens to be the one that's used mainly in the strategy community. Interestingly enough, uh, any entity, biological machine or otherwise, has to observe the environment. What it observes, it must orient itself towards. In other words, it must identify what it's looking at. It must interpret the situation. It must derive feasible aims. It must then generate options to make a decision. It then makes a decision. Having made a decision, it will act upon the decision and it returns back to observation. Now, in a lot of systems, in fact, all of this happens concurrently. Uh, but in the end, there is still this kind of causality chain and cycle. Now, interestingly enough, it turns out that all the phases and subphases, and this was Lachlan's work, present opportunities for deception. So if an attacker knows what they're doing, they can hit any single phase. And subversion is the most dangerous of all because it can influence all four phases and any subphase. So that's the OODA loop. Now let's talk about what happens during a deception. During a deception, we have a victim with some initial state. The victim receives some kind of message. Uh, that message takes some effort on the part of the deceiver to produce, so it incurs a cost. If the deception succeeds, the victim's internal state changes to a new state. Uh, in Bayesian or probabilistic terms, going from a prior internal probability distribution to a posterior probability distribution. Um, deceptions, of course, can be successful. They can be unsuccessful. If the deception is successful, the victim's internal state will change from the initial state to a new state, which is the state the deceiver wanted in the victim. Unsuccessful deceptions may produce no state change at all, or really, really bad for the attacker is the state change will be that the intended victim becomes wary of the attacker and next time around they try, they do not succeed. So the mechanics of this in practical terms are is a deception, a deceiver will get a payoff from a deception if it's successful, they'll incur a cost and possibly a negative payoff if in fact the deception's unsuccessful. So that's a very important item in the logic of how deception works. Now, deception effects, I think it's appropriate to elaborate on that a little bit. And an observation here is that when we did the information theoretic models, they in fact, in effect, validated Greenberg's model because Greenberg essentially did some empirical observations that it appears that our two effects are um, increases in uncertainty and false beliefs, well, the information theory just mathematically locks that down. So increased uncertainty, the victim's beliefs change to reduce certainty in some belief or beliefs. Uh, that in turn can alter the outcome of decision or it can result in delays in making a decision because if you're more unsure, you will spend more time cogitating on that. In extremis, the extreme case, the victim will suffer a decision paralysis situation and is unable to make a decision. And in fact, John Boyd, in a lot of his strategy work, he actually wrote it around this idea of creating this type of decision paralysis by, for instance, introducing random moves in a game just to confuse somebody. There are some very funny anecdotes about that if we have time in question time. Um, False beliefs, of course, victims' beliefs change to accept a falsehood as fact, resulting decisions by the victim will be based on some alternate reality that the attacker desires. Compound deceptions, where you're combining different deception mechanisms and different deception plays, uh, can concurrently, in fact, produce both effects. Very often, you will use uncertainty to reduce the victim's acceptance of a particular established belief. Once they're uncertain about it, you slip in a false belief that replaces the correct belief. Now, this is a conceptual diagram of a compound deception. And uh, we have an attacker, we have a victim. Uh, 
And in this case, we have drawn multiple circles, each of which represents a deception. And there is nothing to prevent an attacker from, in fact, doing multiple deceptions at once concurrently. In the empirical literature, the humanities literature, this is typically called a multi-channel deception or a multi-channel attack. One of the important things that we see when we look at compound deceptions is the problem of a chain, compound chain deception, where the attacker will change the internal state of a victim. That victim then starts propagating the deceptive message and becomes a proxy. Uh, that's huge in social media. That's huge in mass media. If you're a deceiver, um, uh, you're spreading disinformation of some kind. If you can con a journalist to spread your story to an audience of billions, you've done really, really well. And that's why we see so much effort being played in this game of false identities. Now, a nicer way of describing compound deceptions or labeling compound deceptions is to use a state transition model. That's nice and tidy. We computer scientists like these sorts of uh, directed graph-based models. Um, so in this case, we have an initial victim state to transition to the first state of being deceived. Three separate deceptions, A, B, and C, have to work. So the arcs in this graph are, in fact, the deceptions, and the uh, nodes or vertices in this graph are, in fact, the state of the victim. Um, a, B, and C have achieved their effect, so deceptions D and E are applied internal state of victim changes again to D and E achieved effect, then F achieved effect, and then G finally takes it to the final victim state. Now, notably in complex compound attacks, you will see often multiple parallel deception effects that are intended to drive the victim into a state where they will become susceptible to a subsequent deception attack. Get them to accept some false proposition, that allows them to accept other false propositions, very widely used in propaganda. Now, information theory-based models, and I'm really skimming over the top of this. I could talk about this in, in much, much more detail. This is Shannon's, Chan Shannon's channel capacity model, 1948 paper. Bell Labs have an information source, a transmitter. The transmitter takes the message, maps it into some alphabet, transmits it over a channel, noise gets injected into the channel, which in Shannon's model was additive white Gaussian noise. In practice, the noise might have a different distribution. Uh, source and destination, it's assumed, share a common alphabet. So a message that's sent from the source is always, if uncorrupted, understood by the destination. In the real world, different noise distributions, uh, channels may damage messages in different ways. Uh, a common problem that we see uh, certainly in human public discourse is the source alphabet is not understood by the destination. In other words, people interpret what you're saying differently to what your intent is. Finally, message types, just as in Shannon's original, let's, let's call it machine-centric model, uh, vary in probabilities. So... <laughs> To elaborate on this, source and transmitter really depends on context. Examples of human using speech, like myself, is a transmitter, and I'm encoding it into an alphabet, and this apparatus I'm using here to present this to the audience is the transmitter. Channel is uh, whatever carries it to the audience. Uh, another example, an animal coat reflecting sunlight that can be observed by another animal or computer using its network IO. Receiver and destination, again, context. Human might be using hearing, sight, or other sensors. Uh, animal might be using, again, its sensors. Again, computer using network IO. So this is all dependent on the context. And sometimes this is a challenge for some people to uh, map things into a particular context. Now, there are four models that you can use to describe deceptions. And three of them are deeply rooted in Shannon's information theory. Subversion is 
more like uh, messing uh, with uh, a Turing machine. But the idea of degradation is that you make your signal look like noise or you bury a, a weak signal in generated noise and that creates essentially uncertainty. Corruption means taking a known message, mimicking it, mimicking it with a false message. The false message typically has to be sufficiently similar. A phishing attack in cyber is the classic instance of this, okay? Um, from an information theory point of view, the information theoretic distance between the fake and the real has to be small enough that the victim cannot recognize the difference. Denial attacks involve essentially crippling the channel. These can be temporary or permanent. Uh, the idea here is you inject so much noise that you compromise the ability to receive any message, or in fact, you can disable or destroy the channel of uh, de, uh, the victims receive a subsystem so that the basically you blinded, deafened, uh, denied olfactory sense or whatever it is to the victim, or cut a computer cable. Finally, we have subversion in which you have altered the algorithms or other parameters used by the victim to make their decisions or take actions. Uh, I like to describe this as diverting the thread of execution in the Turing machine. You're altering the victim's algorithm that in turn can affect virtually anything the victim does. So effects, degradation produces uncertainty in the overt form or a false belief in the covert form, covert form being where you're so thoroughly hidden in noise, they don't know you're there. Therefore the false belief is you're not there, whereas actually you are. Denial, produces uncertainty because the victim loses the ability to see anything on the channel, although usually the victim knows that they've been denied access to the channel, so they know they're under attack, they just don't know who or how or what. They're left guessing. Finally, subversion will alter the manner in which the victim interprets its beliefs about the environment, may even alter victims' agendas and motivations. That's why subversion is so heavily used in propaganda. So effects. Now, this is a chart that uh, I did for the PLOS One paper in 2018, which is kind of uh, grouping or clustering the effects. So false perceptions, false interpretations, and increases in uncertainty and the individual circles basically represent the different uh, deception models. So that's a nice chart. Uh, I did a sibling chart, which is I looked at the means. So again, the circles represent the individual models or types or forms of deception, or as we called them in the early days, strategies of information warfare. And in this case, uh, you can either attack the channel or you can attack the victim's processing. And that's a key point. You're attacking different things and you're attacking them in different ways to produce one of these two effects. Now, this is a chart which is based on the Shannon, Shannon model chart, which shows how degradation works. In this case, the attacker is basically injecting noise into the channel. That's the overt form. A good example of this is jamming a radio signal, for instance, or flooding a victim in a social media platform with garbage messages or flooding somebody with junk email. They can't see the real thing because it's buried in junk. The other is the covert form, and uh, this is all about hiding in the noise. So you make yourself look like noise, you reduce your signal so it's very, very small, and you sneak through the enemy's defenses by simply being thought of as noise. The effect of this is, of course, a false belief that you're not there, whereas in reality you are. Now, this is an example of degradation. This is a couple of pictures I took at Melbourne Zoo over a number of years. And, you know, uh, is there a cat there in the picture or not? You know, if your eyesight's not very good or you're looking for a big distance, uh, you might not even know there is a cat there. And even if you suspect there is, are you sure what kind of pussycat it is? Which is a snow leopard to the left and a Sumatran tiger to the right. 
Corruption deceptions. Well, the idea of any corruption deception is to create a false belief with a mimic of some kind. In this case, you're injecting a deceptive signal into the channel, which mimics a real channel, so the a real message. So the idea here is that the fake looks so much like the real thing, the victim has no idea and accepts it as a belief as being true when it is not true. Now, this is my favourite examples from nature, which are wasp mimics. The orange wasp moth, a completely harmless moth, but it evolved coloration and shape to really look very much like a real wasp. That's from Central and South America. Uh, to the right, we have an Australian bottle, blush, bottle brush sawfly. I took a picture of this in my backyard a few years ago. I thought, uh, ooh, that's a nice potter wasp. I stuck it up on my Facebook page. Look at what a nice picture of a potter wasp I got. And then I had another look at it and said, well, look, the waist doesn't look right. This can't be a potter wasp. Turns out it's a sawfly, which is a mimic of a potter wasp. So you'll notice it mimics the wasp in shape, coloration sufficiently to fool somebody who's not specifically looking for a distinguishing feature that identifies it as a real potter wasp. Now, denial. Okay, now the effect of denial is uncertainty, even though you might know you've been attacked you lose your capacity to receive messages. Um, you've destroyed or disrupted or disabled the receiver. Now, my favorite example here are skunks and insects that produce similar effects. So there are a number of cockroaches that will spray a nox noxious fluid. I got sprayed by one of these in 1980 when I was working in the Northwest of WA. It took me days to get rid of the stench, didn't matter how much I showered. Uh, then we have stink bugs, which are another example. And the bottom line here is the victim loses their olfactory sense, which is a way of defeating predators. Now, subversion. Okay, in this case, you're introducing false beliefs, false interpretations. You might even be manipulating agendas. That's again typically done by injecting some kind of subversive message or signal. Very often in practice, it is part of a compound deception. So the other deceptions are used to create the right conditions. My favorite biological example are the various cuckoo species, including the cuckoo itself, which is in this case, they emulate, they trick in some fashion the host or the victim, and this is typical for parasites and parasitoids, that uh, the victim then, in an un involuntary fashion, believes that they are doing the right thing and they're doing, in fact, uh, nothing more than servicing uh, a fake. So cuckoo ants are a good example. The queen puts out a pheromone that tricks all the ants into believing that the cuckoo queen is the real queen. So that takes us full circle back to how these models all fit together. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate on that, but that's really just to refresh those ideas. So let's talk a little bit about survivability. So uh, I've got a few minutes, so I'll get through that. So again, a refresh, we're talking about going from an initial state to a new state and doing so with deceptive messages. So let's first ask the question, if we want to have a survivability model, and what do we mean by surviving a deception attack? It means that you walk away intact without your belief system having been manipulated or altered by the attacker. What I did is I looked at different models, the one that seemed to be a best fit but by far was the aerospace model that was done by Bob Ball in 2003. Uh, AIAA published a very nice book on that. In fact, the model's older than that. And the idea there is that you separate exposure to damaging disinformation or deceptions um, from the actual impact or effect of the disinformation. So susceptibility is essentially minimizing or your susceptibility is a measure of how exposed you are to an attack. Vulnerability is a measure of your ability to resist or not resist an attack, okay? Uh, 
the survivability model can be used, this particular model for a posteriori data analysis and a priori modeling, if you have enough data to populate the model. It has been very, very well tested in the aerospace sector. So I'm absolutely confident that it will work. The model is inherently dependent on empirical data, especially when you start looking at populations. So we have two vari variables in this model. One is the probability of the, uh, to, to define the probability of a, a victim surviving a disinformation effect. And these variables are susceptibility and vulnerability. So susceptibility is your probability of exposure to disinformation attack. So if you are the human being here, you could be subjected to word of mouth, print media, analog broadcast media, email messaging tools, social media platform, digital mass media, exposure to deceptive messaging of some kind. So those are essentially means of disinformation delivery. On the other hand, your vulnerability, your inability to resist the attack is determined by a number of internal cognitive effects, in this case, confirmation bias, Dunning-Kruger effect, illusory superiority, motivated cognition, false consensus bias, false uniqueness bias, self-deception, and denial and denialism. And I'll talk briefly about those. So disinformation susceptibility, probability of exposure to disinformation attack, disinformation vulnerability, probability of the victim accepting the false belief or interpretation delivered by the disinformation effect as a true belief, and that, of course, includes uncertainty, in other words, degrading existing beliefs. Now, let's talk a little bit about the idea of... Uh, let me move this out of the way so I can see what's on top. Disinformation, bandwidth, latency, and footprint, and possible channels. So this is a chart that shows disinformation delivery uh, means or mechanisms. Um, we start with word of mouth. That's the oldest through print media, analog broadcast media, email messaging tools, social media, digital mass media. As we run around this circle, what do we see? Increasing bandwidth, increasing footprint, decreasing latency. So word of mouth, you know, maybe a few hundred people if you're on a podium and you've got a gathering, otherwise very small numbers. Print media, you can reach millions or billions, but it takes time, it's slow. Analog broadcasting media, that's near instantaneous, but you have to hit an audience that's got an analog receiver. Email and messaging tools, again, potentially just as fast. Um, and messaging tools have been used very heavily for distributing propaganda and counter-propaganda. Social media platforms, of course, have even bigger footprints and, uh, uh, again, often lower latency. And finally, digital mass media of some kind, where uh, and really most mass media today are digital. Uh, where you can hit audiences of billions as a matter of course, if you're the New York Times, you want to go and put out a fake story, then you have a huge audience and you can get to them in a matter of seconds on a global scale. Now, a key point to make here about this problem is that we see a lot of cross-linking and that's these little arcs in this graph here that interconnect, uh, uh, interconnect the individual media. And what this is all about is, for instance, somebody puts something up on social media, uh, somebody else you, reads it and uses word of mouth to distribute it to other parties. We have a lot of people in the mass media who go trawling social media for stories. Uh, that's a common mechanism for spreading, um, uh, spreading deceptive messages. Uh, an observation here is, <coughs> excuse me, that you can actually legitimate a false message by using a proxy. Uh, a media platform that's trusted is an ideal proxy. If you give them a false, false idea and they spread that false idea, they become a very, very productive proxy in the deception game. Let me convince this thing to move slides. 
So to elaborate briefly on susceptibility, and I really am running out of time here, but we started about five minutes late, for technical reasons. Um, probably a victim-victim population exposure to disinformation attack depends on what channels are the victims exposed to, frequency of disinformation messages. Key point here is echo chambers magnify this problem in social media because people are selectively exposed to deceptive messages <coughs> and the social media platform algorithms will actually hide or exclude messages that don't fit the user profile and as a result might actually refute a deceptive message. The exposure probability problem is basically empirical. If you want to go and look at a population or an individual, uh, and characterize them in some fashion, try and come up with a number for what their susceptibility might be, you <coughs> excuse me, really need to work with a lot of empirical data. Another point here is viral messages give you basically a susceptibility of virtually one because wherever you turn, you'll be exposed to it. Now, vulnerability is, of course, your, a measure of your gullibility, essentially. So gullible users will, social media users, for instance, will accept a disinformation attack as fact, alter their beliefs and interpretations. Skeptical users tend not to. And obviously, there's a con, you could call it a continuum of gullibility versus skeptability, uh, sorry, versus skepticism, the far end. So gullible users have high vulnerability, skeptical users have low vulnerability. If a disinformation deception in fact fails, skeptical users are likely to become more skeptical, less vulnerable to future attacks. Root cause of disinformation vulnerability, as I noted before, cognitive biases. Now, we don't really have time to elaborate in detail on what these cognitive biases are, but they're all very, very well covered in the psychology literature, cognitive science literature. <coughs> Some of them are particularly interested uh, social cognitive dysfunctions, such as false consensus bias, false uniqueness bias, also denial and denialism. And uh, they're becoming increasingly prominent today as problems in the broader social context. So punchline here is vulnerability is inherently empirical. Data has to be collected if you want to come up with some kind of good numbers to describe different victim types. So pulling this all together, how do we calculate survivability? Well, it's one minus susceptibility times vulnerability, and this is just borrowed straight from Ball's work uh, published in 2003. So there we have the definitions, probability of surviving, probability of exposure or being hit by disinformation, probability of succumbing to the hit or your vulnerability. Uh, while the model can or is basically defined for an individual, if you've got enough data, you can basically apply this to a population. Now, just to elaborate on populations, and I'm almost done. I think this is my second or third last slide. Populations are, of course, groups of individuals. Each individual has unique exposure to disinformation attacks, therefore unique susceptibility. Each has their own cognitive biases, social cognitive dysfunctions, how they process information. That in turn means they have unique vulnerability. Survivability of a population is really determined by what fraction of the population will survive a disinformation attack. In other words, come out without, without their beliefs being altered uh, or without being in some fashion seduced by the false belief being produced by the attack. Now, this problem is by its nature inherently statistical as populations in democracies are inhomogeneous, and that's both in their exposure, but especially their biases and errors. And we see this in a lot of political opinion surveys and a lot of post-mortems. There's a vast amount of empirical data that shows this is the case. Uh, 
if there is a disinformation attack, one way to see whether it's in fact worked is to do an opinion poll and see what fraction of the population survived the attack without their beliefs being altered or succumbed to the attack and got suckered in, okay? This is, of course, assuming they're answering the polls correctly, and that's a problem in its own right. So to wrap up, conclusions, key challenges. Well, we've demonstrated the information theoretic models work very well, and other people have since been use, using them in their papers. I did a peer review on an IEEE paper about three weeks ago that, in fact, did exactly this. Other challenges that have yet to be solved. So these are the unsolved problems, and it's not all of them, but these are the ones that I think are important. Repeatable modeling methods for victim prior posterior states that involve using cognitive cycles, perceptual and interpretive mechanisms in the victims. The second one is how do we deal with learning? Because the reality is that both attackers and victims learn as they go. So if an attacker keeps throwing out deceptions, the deceptions fail. They'll learn that the deceptions fail. They'll try and come up with better working deceptions. Um, we uh, have the same thing by victims. If a deception fails, the victim becomes skeptical. They learn. Uh, the more skeptical they become, the harder they are to deceive. Three, the self-deception problem. Now, there are two basic models, Bob Trivers' model, Professor Ramachandran's model. They are quite different. Uh, they may, in fact, both be happening concurrently. We don't know. That's a topic all in its own. I could talk about that for an hour at least. And uh, we don't have a resolution at this stage. Uh, we know empirically the problems exist. Coming up with good models to describe and capture susceptibility and vulnerability behavior in mixed populations where we have, uh, in fact, very different uh, susceptibility and vulnerability across the population. And number five, finally, coming up with good models for disrupting compound deceptions, because most deceptions that are causing most trouble today, compound deceptions, especially deceptions using proxies. Uh, for those who are mathematically minded, this is the cut vertex problem in graph theory, the idea of knocking out particular arcs or particular vertices in the graph. So if you find a, some, some particular way of getting rid of a vertex in the graph, you've prevented that compound deception from working. So that's all I had to say to have to say in the time that I have. Uh, so I think we're open to questions now. All right, thank you very much, uh, Carlo, for the nice presentation. Um, so are there any questions? Yeah, I, I have one question. There's there's an interesting case at the moment. I don't know if you've heard that as well. There seems to be the impression that the German government does not properly support Ukraine with military material, vehicles, weapons, whatnot. If you look at the numbers and what Ukraine says themselves, it turns out not to be necessarily true because you find there's something like 14,000 anti-tank mines, 700 man pads, lots of vehicles, the jet parts make a big difference and all that. So there seems to be some interest of the German government to seem to not to supply a lot of material to the Ukraine. And, and that's a really interesting disinformation thing because there's nobody who would really work against it except maybe some press or somebody because there's nobody who really has the interest to show it. Well, how, how would that fit into your mind? All right. Well, that's an interesting problem because certainly I've been reading a lot about this particular problem in the press. And uh, the real issue here is the Ukrainians have been asking for specific types of equipment, which the German government believes it is unable to supply because it does not have enough of this equipment. And uh, 
certainly from what I've seen, I think in the dismal state of the Bundeswehr, okay, I think there's enough evidence to show that when they say they can't supply leopard tanks or they can't supply uh, surface-to-air missile batteries or other things in large quantities quickly, uh, that's certainly true. By the same token, reading the German press, which I've done in some instances, Spiegel and uh, and Welt and others, I think there have been quite a few instances where the uh, Bundesregierung took a little bit too long time, too, too much time to actually decide whether they could or couldn't, or in some instances promised things they thought they could deliver then when they went back to the ministry, they discovered that the equipment, in fact, was in such a parlous condition it couldn't be used. Um, so in this case, uh, who's telling the truth? This is political argument. Uh, I think uh, Germany has supplied uh, some very potent equipment. Uh, the question here is quantities. Yes, uh, but there also seems to be the motivation that the German government does not want to appear to supply too much because they still want to, uh, to precisely appear to, that so yes. there's really interesting conflicting well it uh, is interest in it. well and this is a it fight would, would really is... interesting to see how they would pick into the model I yes mean, how yes. could you model these kind of very conflicting it, it would make from the yes. same people actually yes it would make an interesting case study Carsten in fact uh looking at the fact because you've got multiple players here, the SDP, uh, uh, Social Democrat parties internally divided over the issue. So there's one group that doesn't want to supply any aid. There are others that want to supply as much aid as possible. Poor Chancellor Schultz is sort of being torn in every direction. His green coalition partners want to supply as much aid as they can. So this is very interesting because you'd model this as a multiplayer game. And then you would start looking at the different messages the different parties are sending. And if there's an opportunity, of course, to make the other side look silly or wrong, uh, we've seen that over and over again in this debate. Okay. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm also doing uh, one of the major research direction is also disinformation. So that's uh, particularly interesting for me. Uh, I have one uh, question in general that is like, um, those are very nice models and it's well established, but uh, how do we um, validate that by using um, like real data? For example, like one of your slides you show there's like a multi-channel, right? The social media, the mass media, starting from word of mouth and then all the way the cycle. Um, yes, we all believe that. And through our study, we did find um, people are not sticking only to one channel, for example, social media, which is easy to collect data, but they also, for example, watch local TV, etc. cetera. Um, but how can we collect data about that and then validate the impact of different sources, channels, or et cetera? Um, this is one example. Another one is um, some of the models they use like probability-based theory, and uh, that require um, some uh, a sufficient amount of data. So um, I don't know, like uh, when you apply the model, do you apply that on individual person so that you have to collect the history behavior about a particular user, or you generally apply that to a certain population and as you mentioned, uh, different population, different groups, they have different, they, they are heterogeneous. So um, those are basically my questions. Well, and these are in fact, very good questions. And it really boils down to uh, how much accuracy do you need in the model that you're working with? Now, if we look at the survivability model and you want to ask a simple question, did more than 51% of them get suckered by the deception or not, then you need a lot less data to do that than to do a very detailed comprehensive analysis. Now, I've seen quite a few very good papers in recent years done looking at social media uh, deceptions that happened during the uh, US election in 2016, where they did some quite comprehensive and deep analysis on individuals who agreed to be interviewed in detail uh, 
to see, in fact, how well particular deceptions work, what sunk in, what didn't sink in. Then on that basis, they tried to produce statistical models that describe the overall impact on the population. So I think the central question there is, given what you're trying to learn in a modeling exercise, how much accuracy is required to get a useful result? And I think you work back from that. Um, obviously, uh, given the nature of human wetware, trying to know everything that's going, going on inside the head of every victim is not feasible. And any psychologist will tell you the victims most of the time don't know themselves. So uh, I think, uh, and this is, gets back to what I said uh, in the final slide about coming up with good models for particularly vulnerability of populations. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. I th oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk, Carlo. Thanks. Um, I guess I wanted to comment on two things. Um, firstly, uh, Carsten's point of uh, the, the example and, and putting aside the details of what, what is or what isn't. Um, what we know in psychology about uh, what's believable in terms of deception is actually a technique called paltering. So when you mix a bit of the truth with, with the falsity, you're more likely to persuade. And I think that's a good example of that, like some of it's real. So do I believe all of it's real or can I look through that? Um, and, and then what is it trying to make? Why is it trying to make change in mind, right? So it's, you know, trying to make you take sides align in different ways. Yes. Um, so I think that that's a nice example of that. You know, where, where do you want to believe which bits, and will you bother to find out? And they use you use paltering in all sorts of ways, not just on state level, but individual level too. Um, yeah. So it's it's a good technique if you want to get out of something. Yes. <laughs> better truth, better public, yeah. Better. Yeah. And I think you could probably find mountains of it in Bernays's work and Goebbels's work. Yeah. Well, um, there's loads of work in psychology. <laughs> but there's over the years, many, many people. Um, in terms of the data, you were saying one of the things that um, they do in meeting communication studies is actually do diary studies. And we did a diary study ourselves looking at deception. And that's a good way to collect data to be able to look at the different models of deception and what's more likely to persuade. Um, and I guess just one other point. It's really, it's really interesting, but difficult to look at these differences because it's not just, sometimes you're looking at a group of people and and Carsten's example is looking at society and what society is going to believe. But other times you're looking at an individual and, and the harms that that can cause that individual. And psychologically, it makes a difference what variables you're looking at there yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah, but really interesting talk. I thoroughly enjoyed all of it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Anybody in our yeah, audience? Think, yeah, I think there's a question from Vanessa in the audience. So yes, Vanessa, hello. would you like to ask? Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. That's really interesting. Um, I would like to ask about this theme of echo chambers and ask what the role of privacy violation in... So you uh, can turn on your microphone. <laughs> I thought my, I think my microphone is on. It doesn't seem to work. Oh, yeah, um, I can hear you, Vanessa, if it doesn't work. actually. Did somebody say they can hear me or they can't hear me? Uh, yes, I, I can. I'm on Zoom. I think they may not be able to. <laughs> Maybe Zoom people can hear me, but other people can't. Uh, hang on. Let me, let me see if I can type. Nope. Hmm. Um, that's disappointing, isn't it? For some reason, I can't type into the chat either. So, yeah, Zoom. Uh -huh, okay, apparently... We are. We can't hear Vanessa, but uh, some others can hear. Uh, <laughs> Muhammad, would you like to repeat the question? Uh, can Can you hear me, Ron? Yeah, I can hear Muhammad. Shall I Shall I just dictate to you? Uh, has that? <laughs> I think they also can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, Zoom thinks it's working. <laughs> uh, well, uh, can I try? Yeah. 
let's say. Can you yeah, see yeah, my... Vanessa, you can go ahead and okay, type awesome. it. Apparently, we need to change the speaker in the room. <laughs> Zoom settings, different speaker. Uh, All right. What is the role of privacy invasion in facilitating deception? If we had better privacy laws. All right. I've lost that. Yeah, what is the role of privacy invasion in facilitating deception? And enforce them. Could we defend ourselves better? Well, it's a question of what you define as privacy invasion. Uh, if, for instance, uh, you include nasty spams and messages and uh, all the garbage I get to see on Telegram and WhatsApp and elsewhere, it's unsolicited. Yes, that would help. Uh, some people will dutifully read all the junk that arrives in their uh, input channels and uh, get suckered as a result. Uh, but more generally, I think it wouldn't make a huge difference because that is only one of uh, a great many possible channels that are used to distribute deceptive messages. Uh, my big concern really is media mass media basically collecting garbage or creating garbage and uh, distributing it because that creates both uncertainties that uh, create opportunities for deceivers and disinformation purveyors, but also sometimes counts as disinformation all on, all, all on its own. And I can think of a number of major media players that have basically created stories. Um, well, micro-targeting, yes, uh, and I agree. Micro-targeting, uh, again, boils down to optimizing the targeting of the messages to the individual victim. So you are increasing susceptibility. If you can defeat micro-targeting, ban micro-targeting, you make it a lot harder for them to produce or rather uh, hit victims with messages that are more effective. So the answer is yes. Uh, can you hear us now? Yes, yes. Room? Ah, okay. Uh, Vanessa, yeah, Van you can speak on. Yeah, Vanessa, you can speak if you want to respond. Or... But now you're on. Yes, how's this? Uh, yes. This is good, yeah. Oh, victory. Okay. Hello. Uh, sorry, that was all typed in very slowly. But yes, I was talking about micro-targeting, exactly the point you just made, because it seems to me that um, this facility, the, in the, the game, that nice little simple game model that you introduced earlier, you had a sort of probability of success and then you had a probability of sort of backfiring and being noticed um, and so forth. And it seems to me that the the sliding scale there is highly dependent on whether you've done a good job of targeting something that the person is well look any good propagandist or advertising executive will tell you that targeting is everything exactly and uh it's hitting uh knowing what the victims are susceptible to and most susceptible to is how you in fact maximize your payoff or your probability of success so if we were trying to, let's say, influence public policy about trying to defend Australians against political disinformation, to what extent would better privacy law be a priority of that effort? That depends on what's included in the definition of privacy laws. If uh, denying or defeating or banning micro-targeting uh, for distribution of political messages uh, was uh, was the case, and that was included in privacy laws, yes, then I think you could significantly reduce impact or opportunities for deceivers to hit their victims. Uh, but look, the same thing applies to the echo chamber effect. 
because where you have algorithms that are doing things like filtering news and uh, where you have groups of people, all of whom come predisposed to believe something or believe something that's false, you put a bunch of them together, you'll basically end up with the mechanics of groupthink taking over, uh, where they'll all run around and tell each other how wonderful they are and uh, how, uh, you know, this X, Y, Z is uh, terrible. And in fact, that's been one of the mechanisms that we've seen in a lot of mischievous, uh, let's call it uh, uh, political activity in social media. And of course, a lot of the propaganda and the, uh, uh, the whole troll army thing is all about this, which is going into an echo chamber and uh, disrupting an echo chamber that believes otherwise or reinforcing an echo chamber that believes something that they want them to believe. Hmm, terrific talk. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yeah, uh, that was a good discussion. So thank you, everyone, for joining our uh, Monash Cybersecurity Seminar, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Been my pleasure.